So, good morning. Welcome back to Sala Galatea. Now we have uh, uh, this meeting on transatlantic cooperation, benefits for SMEs. Um, as you know, it's divided in two parts. Part one, uh, which uh, starts now, it's about driving SME growth in Europe and United States. Uh, we will have uh, speakers. Uh, His Excellency Anthony Gardner, EU, uh, sorry, US, US Ambassador to the EU, Daniel Calleja, uh, EU SME Envoy and Director General for uh, Enterprise and Industry, Kim Benson, Vice President King International, and Daniele Vaccarino, President CNA. But we have also the commissioner, uh, Mr. Nelly Ferrucci, because we found him in the audience, sitting in the audience, ready to listen to us. And we said, you have to come on the stage and say a few words for, for this topic. Please. It was very reluctant. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for accepting uh, or for interfering with the organization of this uh, session this morning. But since this subject was so interesting, I thought that I couldn't miss it. And also because of the protagonist of this panel. So I wanted to be here, but I'm here basically and fundamentally to listen. Just a few words uh, to uh, tell you why I consider TTIP a, a strategic subject also for SMEs. Uh, this is for uh, the first time since many years, uh, the most ambitious attempt to liberalize trade and investment across the Atlantic. Uh, uh, I have participated in my previous uh, position as permanent representative to the proceedings that led to the approval of the negotiating mandate uh, by the European Union, and I am very well aware of the difficulties that we had at that point uh, in reaching an agreement. Uh, the ambitions are great, uh, the difficulties are also rather important. So uh, I think that we have to be aware that uh, there is a need for strong political determination in order to be able to achieve uh, an agreement which has to be uh, successful for both parties, for the US uh, and European Union. I also think that this is particularly important, I mean, this debate, this exchange of views on TTIP and its perspective in the context of this uh, assembly uh, which takes place in Naples because of the impact that a hopefully successful and ambitious agreement will have on the prospect of internationalization of SMEs in particular. So uh, thank you again for accepting me in this panel. Apologize for interfering with your organization and uh, buon lavoro a tutti. Grazie. <laughs> Grazie al commissario Nelly Feroci. Now I'll give the floor to Ambassador Gardner for his speech. È un piacere tornare qui in Italia, un piacere tornare qui a Napoli, dove ho trascorso tanti momenti felici della mia vita. Però visto che la lingua franca di questo panel è inglese, credo che continuerò in inglese. Um, I wanted to recognize a number of people here today. First of all, uh, our excellent chargé uh, in Rome, Kathleen Doherty, who, with whom I've had the opportunity to work and uh, Colombo Barras, who's our Consul General also in, in Naples. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with the Commissioner, with Daniel, an old friend from 20 years ago. We first met when I was working at the European Commission. We've kept in touch. Daniel's done an excellent job. He's a trusted interlocutor, trusted partner of the United States, and we have a very warm and strong relationship with um, the DG Enterprise. I really believe in this subject. I believe in it not just from a theoretical point of view, I believed in it as a former practitioner for a number of years before becoming ambassador to the European Union. I was in various banks where we were financing small and medium-sized enterprises. I was then in a private equity fund where, where we were financing small and medium-sized enterprises all over Europe in the services industries, in financial services, healthcare services, education, and other services. This, if I had to identify one topic 
key topic for both of us on the United States, in the United States, in Europe, that is necessary for launching uh, growth, for stimulating growth and employment, it is this, small and medium-sized enterprises, because they obviously, on both sides, represent the backbone of our economies. Small firms account for 63% of new jobs created in the United States between 1993 and 2013. Now, today I intend to focus my remarks on just on three things. First, how the U.S. policy environment contributes to the growth of small and medium-sized enterprises. Second, how the U.S. government assists small and medium-sized enterprises. And third, TTIP, which is uh, obviously an important topic. So, how uh, has the U.S. federal government uh, contributed to entrepreneurship and uh, small and medium-sized enterprise growth in the United States? Well, in several ways. Now, even though creation and incorporation of businesses is a state competence, so and the 50 states determine that, but there are a number of things on a federal level that have promoted growth uh, of SMEs. First, I would mention, which is also important, I think is a lesson for Europe, is bankruptcy law one of the key factors in creating an environment that allows for failure and learning. Failure is feedback, is the mindset of highly successful entrepreneurs who view their first, second, and sometimes third startup as feedback on what they did wrong and what they did right in order to get their plan to succeed. It's imperative that governments foster an environment where failure isn't the same as disaster. In the United States, it's relatively easy for individuals to file for bankruptcy and as a consequence have their debts completely discharged while keeping a portion of their assets. This means that the price of failure is not so high as to discourage entrepreneurs from taking the risk that is associated with starting a new venture. And perhaps even more importantly, bankruptcy in the United States does not carry with it large social stigma. Second, immigration also highly relevant to Europe today. It's another way in which the United States has promoted entrepreneurship. By allowing talented people to immigrate to the United States or remain there after completing higher education, the United States has created an environment in which small, medium-sized enterprises can flourish. According to the Immigration Policy Center think tank, immigrants contribute to the United States' economic growth and competitiveness by earning degrees in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and many other fields from U.S. research universities. By allowing these talented people to stay in the United States and by allowing other similarly talented people to immigrate to the United States, we help ensure American business has a large talent pool from which to draw. Indeed, from 1995 to 2005, fully one half of the CEOs of high-tech businesses in the United States were immigrants. This includes thousands of companies, Google, Yahoo, eBay, companies that are still driving the U.S. economy today. Immigrants in the United States also contribute to the country's innovation economy by earning patents on new research, products, and ideas. According to the Partnership uh, for a New American Economy, 76 percent of patents awarded to the top 10 patent-producing U.S. universities in 2011 had at least one foreign-born inventor. Mindful of the fact that many of the people with skills live outside our borders, President Obama has said immigration policy is an economic imperative to keep us competitive. The United States also promotes innovation and entrepreneurship through the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. This legislation was passed by Congress to help promote the commercialization of technology developed through the use of federal grant money by allowing researchers and small businesses to retain the patent rights to any inventions that result from the use of that money. And it's the Bayh-Dole Act that is often cited as the catalyst for growth of the American high-tech and biotech industries. But having good policies in place is just one piece of the puzzle. It's also very important for governments to look at ways in which they can support entrepreneurship and growth of small and medium-sized enterprises. Similar to the European Enterprise Network, the U.S. Small Business Administration, commonly referred to as SBA, conducts training and counseling programs that provide the business fundamentals that help take companies to the next level in terms of growth and management. 
One of the key challenges for small and medium-sized enterprises is access to capital. I saw that directly, how difficult it was for small and medium-sized enterprises to get capital. Often I can tell you, when I was trying to find financing for our portfolio companies that had profits of less than 5 million euros, I found almost only three banks willing to provide senior debt financing. I then had to be more inventive. I had to look for mezzanine capital, hybrid capital, uh, and look for other sources uh, that were uh, either governmental funding. And it was extremely difficult to do so on reasonable rates. And you can imagine how difficult it is when you're financing a business at 10% plus, sometimes 15% uh, interest rates. So one novel way in which the SBA responds to the challenge of capital is through its Small Business Investment Company program. This is a multi-billion dollar program, consists of privately owned and managed investment funds licensed and regulated by the SBA that use their own capital together with funds borrowed with an SBA guarantee to make equity and debt investments in qualifying small businesses. The US um, small Business Administration does not invest directly into small businesses through this program, but rather provides funding to qualified investment management firms with expertise in certain sectors. Now, last year, the SBA provided, through this program, over $2 billion in new loan commitments and financed over 1,000 businesses. Of these, 30% were low to moderate income neighborhoods, were in low to moderate income neighborhoods or minority or women-owned businesses. And some of our most successful corporations, including Apple, Sun, Microsystems, AOL, FedEx, for example, received financing from the program during their early stages of growth. Another innovative SBA program encourages domestic small businesses to engage in federal research and development that has the potential to be commercialized. The program enables small businesses to explore their technological potential and provides the incentive to profit from uh, its commercialization. This program targets the entrepreneurial sector because that is where most innovation uh, and innovators thrive. The program funds the critical startup and development stages and encourages the commercialization of the technology, product, or service, thereby stimulating the U.S. economy. Companies funded under the program have enhanced our defense, protected our environment, advanced our health care, and improved our ability to manage information and manipulate data. Now, access to finance is not enough to ensure that a new business succeeds. There are multiple of issues that a new business must consider. Recognizing the valuable role that a mentor can play in the life of a new entrepreneur, SBA has developed a partnership with a national network of seasoned business executives that serve as mentors for small and medium-sized businesses that need help in developing business plans, marketing strategies, and other tools they need to build successful businesses. Now, the federal government also uses a so-called set-aside program. What is that? It is a program to help support the viability of small and medium-sized enterprises. Every federal government purchase anticipated to be valued from $2,500 to $100,000 is automatically set aside for small businesses, as long as there are at least two companies that can provide the product or service. Contracts over $100,000 can be set aside if enough small businesses are able to do the work. Contracts over $500,000 have to include a small business subcontracting plan so that small businesses can get work under these large contracts. Those are just a few examples of what the SPA does to assist small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, what about TTIP? I have to tell you something. The language you use on TTIP, TTIP is not working. And I can say that because I speak a lot about TTIP, and I scratch my head. The language we use to describe what we're trying to do is not making an impact. And I think part of it is because it's too theoretical, it's too general, there are not enough stories, there are not enough concrete examples of how it can help, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises. And I say small and medium-sized enterprises because this is not about big business only, of course it will help big business, but it's also about you, it's about this sector. Now sometimes I get a bit of a, a quizzical or skeptical look in the audience, well we don't sell to the United States, how on earth can TTIP help us? Well, 
let's say a business doesn't sell to the United States, but it does, it usually, it is part of a supply chain, and it does sell to another business that perhaps is a bit larger, maybe it's a German Mittelstand, Mittelstand company that does sell to the United States. So there is a trickle-down effect, number one. And number two, with the internet, even small, medium-sized enterprises can adopt a strategy to sell across uh, to the United States. And third, although, again, this is more of a theoretical argument, but it's a real argument. The reason this whole TTIP is about SMEs is that the larger companies have the money and they have the time, they have the expertise and the consultants to deal with all of the obstacles of selling it to the United States, or in the case of the United States, selling to Europe. It's very confusing. If we can manage, even partially, in addressing the non-tariff barriers, or the, bar the, the barriers behind the borders, then small and medium-sized businesses will benefit. I'm not saying it'll be easy, for example, to engage in mutual recognition or common standards. It will be a difficult exercise to do that. But if we can say, well, there's, we're going to adopt test once accepted everywhere, even in specific sectors, and we're talking about quite a few, chemicals and pharmaceuticals and automobile, safety, it will result in huge, huge savings. I'm optimistic. Americans tend to be optimistic, but I can tell you I am optimistic. Why am I optimistic? I look at the mission letters that were written by President Juncker to his team. I have never seen, in 23 years I've been following EU issues, I've never seen such an emphasis on entrepreneurship. That word, I think, was used six or seven times. Growth, jobs, employment, for obvious reasons, you may think. Europe needs jobs, growth, employment, entrepreneurship. But I believe it this time. I think it is probably the single, uh, f the largest focus of this new commission under Juncker, and I believe it's the right one, and we applaud it. So there are millions of small manufacturers and producers in Europe in the United States. They produce some 30% of goods exported from both markets, as well as contributing to the supply chain of large manufacturers. As I said, they're very well placed to gain also from the elimination of tariffs that TTIP also aims to achieve. Now, yes, tariffs tend to be low, but it does mask some areas where they are still relatively high, and those gains could be very significant. And today's competitive marketplace, even small increases in a product's cost due to tariffs can mean the difference between making and losing a sale for a small and medium-sized enterprise. In some cases, the removal of tariffs could allow SMEs to sell their products across the Atlantic for the first time. I mentioned the importance of non-tariff barriers that have a disproportionate impact on SMEs. In addition, a central goal of TTIP is to, cre is to uh, enhance openness and transparency, reduce unnecessary costs, administrative delays also at the border in terms of customs delays. I mentioned regulatory compatibility. All of these will have a significant effect. Now let me get back to the messaging for a moment, and I'll just end here. I mentioned that our messaging somehow isn't making enough of an impact, but let me make one argument here that is, is rarely made. The single market is not criticized today. There are a lot of things about this deal that are being criticized, but the single market in Europe is not criticized. It has been the source of enormous wealth creation here in Europe. Europeans should be fundamentally at ease with the concept of the elimination of tariffs and the mutual recognition of goods and services. It's happened here, and all Europeans have benefited. So what is so fundamentally scary about taking some of those principles of a European single market and extending it across the Atlantic? That shouldn't scare anybody. It should result in greater choice lower prices for consumers, and better opportunities to export across the Atlantic, oh, and by the way, for more jobs and growth. And it doesn't matter if the Commission's projections about growth and jobs coming out of TTIP, I don't know, maybe they're accurate, I assume they're accurate, maybe they're a bit optimistic, I have no idea, but my answer is it doesn't matter. Even if they were double of what will occur, Europe should embrace it because Europe at this time does not have many levers for growth. Perhaps it's the completing the single market, the digital single markets, labor market reform. We can mention a lot of things. TTIP is one of the levers for growth in jobs. The reason perhaps the TTIP is 
is triggering some fears, I think has nothing to do with actual, the actual substance of these negotiations. These are fears, perhaps, that are related to projects that are led by governments, by Brussels, and there's some fears also for the United States. But we should attack those fears head on and not pretend that it's chlorinated chicken or GMOs or the lowering of standards really this issue because none of those are actually issues in these negotiations. So in concluding, I think this deal is important. I am confident we're going to get there. We are making good progress. There have been meetings this week, seventh round of our negotiators outside of Washington. We have consolidated text in five areas. The regulatory component is the most difficult piece of it, but I also see in this particular chapter some real, uh, some, some real headway that's been made in specific areas will have an impact on this community. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador Gardner. Now, Daniel Kaleja. Thank you very much, Commissioner, Ambassador, dear Tony, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by saying uh, how delighted I am to be here today in this discussion on uh, the transatlantic cooperation and the role of SMEs. And a special word of thanks to Commissioner Nelly Ferocci. I know he was yesterday in the opening of our SME assembly with President Napolitano, <clears throat> and he has a very busy schedule. He's been a very active commissioner, and I appreciate very much that he took the time to be with us and to share uh, in his presence this discussion. Also, a special word of thanks to Ambassador Gardner. He, has, he speaks fluent Italian. He has worked in the European Commission. Sometimes people say the EU ambassador, or no, the US ambassador, because <laughs> actually I th he's such a strong uh, friend and he's such a, a determined person who is working to favor EU-US relations that uh, we sometimes have the impression when we work with him that we are actually working on the same side. It's not a dialogue on two different sides. He, he really is a, a, a champion of EU-US uh, integration. Now, I would like to share with you some views, and I will follow the same structure as Ambassador Gardner. I would like to concentrate on three points. First of all, SMEs in Europe, what is the situation? We have heard the situation in the US, what is the situation in Europe? Second, the key priorities of our policy, but I, should, I will be very brief because in many of these issues are well known. And last point on the TTIP and transatlantic cooperation. And let me start by saying how important this cooperation is for us. The United States and Europe represent about half of the total world GDP. We are a third of world trade flow. If we are able to consolidate, if we are able to make this deal, we will be uh, putting trade and investment as the key drivers of the transatlantic relationship. And as the ambassador was saying rightly, this means more growth, this means, this means more, more jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. And the only way to do so, apart from very protracted and very difficult technical negotiations, is to put SMEs at the center of our efforts. Because at the end of the day, SMEs are the engine of the real economy. In Europe, SMEs represent 99% of all EU companies. In the US, you have a lower share. There are less SMEs proportionally, but this is because you have much bigger companies. We would not mind having less SMEs if that meant that we were having bigger companies. So I think this is a very interesting feature in our relationship. 57% of the EU's GDP is provided by SMEs and two out of three jobs in the private sector come from the smallest companies. And SMEs in Europe do more for job creation than larger companies. In the last five years, 85% of all new jobs in Europe were created by SMEs. We are speaking about 4.1 million jobs every year 
created by European SMEs. With these figures, we don't need to go into any more detail because we, there is only one conclusion. EU policy has to put SMEs at the top. And this is why, over the past years, through the Small Business Act, but also for the new commission, the uh, priority of SMEs, including for the first time also putting them in the center of the new DG, which will be in charge from 1st of November of the internal market, industry, SMEs and entrepreneurship figure now on the top of the agenda. We have been doing many things at the level of the European Commission. Let me mention some. The Small Business Act started in 2008, reviewed in 2011. The strategy on SME internationalization. Our industrial policy, reindustrializing Europe, renaissance of European industry. Support to key enabling technologies. Financial instruments. We had the pleasure in the presence of Commissioner Nelly Ferrocci to sign the delegation agreements for the implementation of COSME, but also Horizon 2020, and of course, the ongoing TTIP negotiation. Throughout all policies, SMEs play a key role in Europe. And like in the United States, we follow the principle of subsidiarity. We are active in areas where there is a clear EU added value. Countries and regions have very active policies, but we intervene to supplement these policies. Our financial instruments are a good example. Also, some examples of legislation. Let me mention the Late Payments Directive, which is also an example of intervening to support the SME's access to finance. But we have been focusing in four key areas. Cutting red tape, access to finance, access to markets, and entrepreneurship. And we were discussing this morning that we will be adding a fifth priority, and this is skills, trying to do more to support dual training, vocational training in our companies. We need to do more about simplification, about cutting red tape in Europe, facilitating business transfer, a second chance for honest entrepreneurs. This is a big difference with the United States. I was struck by the comments of the ambassador about the difference in a, of approach. In Europe, when you fail, when an honest entrepreneur fails, he's pointed at with the finger. In the US, you have a culture of trying it again. This is a cultural revolution that we have to lead. Transfer of business. We are losing every year in Europe 150,000 businesses and 450,000 jobs because we don't have a good solution for transfers of business. So this is an area where we are working. Reducing licensing times for companies. Reduce also administrative burden. Our program of the top 10 most burdensome pieces of EU law. And the thing small first principle is increasingly applied. We are also supporting entrepreneurship. Erasmus for young entrepreneurs. We were in the stand outside to support young entrepreneurs coaching and first-hand advice from an experienced entrepreneur on how to create and manage a startup. We are doing it in Europe. Shouldn't we do it also with a transatlantic scale? Favor the exchanges between entrepreneurs on both sides of the Atlantic? We want to promote also entrepreneurship on some groups of our society. We want to increase the ratio of female entrepreneurship to 40% before the end of 2017. We need to ensure women have easier access to finance. Only 20% of businesses in Europe started with venture capital belong to female entrepreneurs. There's a lot to do in programs for seniors, for migrants. I was struck by the example you were giving of the telecom sector in the United States. 50% of the CEOs, immigrants. I think this is, there are lessons which we could take up in Europe. So there's a lot of plans, there are a lot of programs we will be discussing later on during the day with the SME envoys. But I want to focus on the opportunities for the transatlantic markets. I think I have mentioned the figures what the EU and the US represent in terms of trade, in terms of investment. We are each other's most important trade 
and investment partners in the world. We are already now more integrated than any other economic relationship in the world. Some 15 million jobs depend on transatlantic trade and investments. But we have not yet succeeded in strong participation by SMEs because it would facilitate more competition, more innovation, more productivity, and lower prices. What have, we, what have we been doing? Since 2011, we started a very good, a very vibrant dialogue with the United States. And I'm very happy that many of the colleagues are here. I want to pay tribute to the excellent work of Cristina Sevilla and her team, but also American and European entrepreneurs participating in this dialogue. We have discussed best practices, redu reduction of trade barriers, standardization, IPR, environmental issues, commercialization of innovation, clusters, crowdfunding, excellent work. But we need now to move to a higher stage. This is not enough. This is not enough for the ambitions that the EU and the US have, and this is not enough for the SMEs. We have an ambitious objective. We would like in the TTIP to have, for the first time in a free trade agreement, a chapter dedicated to SMEs. SMEs cannot just be something ancillary, which is covered here and there. They should have a special, specific treatment in our agreement. This would be a signal that for the first time in a negotiation of this ambition, we could have SMEs also in the center of this negotiation. This would also help some of the problems of communication, some of the misunderstandings. Many companies say, what is this negotiation for me? I don't see, this is for big business. No, I think the existence within the agreement of an SME chapter could be a very strong message. Second thing we need to do, in my opinion, is to give priority to information sharing. There are big problems on both sides of the Atlantic in information about the programs, about the initiatives, about the linkages. We should try to link, to, in to enhance, to strengthen information sharing on both sides of the Atlantic. And we should do something else. We should try also to move forward in linking not only the SMEs but our networks. We have our Enterprise Europe network, the United States has its network. We signed an agreement with Michael Camunes, its commerce and a DG Enterprise to start working together, we should consolidate this relationship because this is the best way to support SMEs on both sides of the Atlantic. And we would also like to have a tool to monitor the application of the agreement, an SME committee who would have the task of monitoring how the agreement is going for SMEs that could intervene, that could discuss. We need also to see how we can integrate business organizations on both sides of the Atlantic so that they can play a role. Of course, there will be lots of negotiations, lots of discussion. There you will receive more information in, a, in the following panel from the chief negotiators. But I would like to conclude, like uh, uh, my friend Tony Gardner, with a message of confidence. When we hear about and we examine US and EU policies, it is evident that in this area we subscribe to a similar philosophy. We are like-minded partners. There are some things where we have to learn a lot from the United States, your entrepreneurship culture, how you are dealing with innovation, with innovative sources of financing. I think we can also bring our input on the different instruments that we are pursuing our agenda for better regulation, the design of the internal market. There are good things that we can put on the table. We have the same priorities, providing access to finance for our SMEs, growth innovation, doubling our exports in the transatlantic market, bringing down administrative barriers, facilitating mutual recognition on standards on both sides of the Atlantic. So I strongly believe we have a win-win opportunity. 
our SMEs should benefit reciprocally from the opportunities offered by our transatlantic partnership. And I think there could be a great change in favor of more growth and more jobs. This negotiation is about a partnership for growth. Millions of SMEs, millions of citizens on both sides of the Atlantic will benefit from this if we are successful. This is a huge responsibility, but it is also a great opportunity. And I would like to conclude with a final thought. I think it is such a great challenge that only Europeans and Americans can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Callega. Um, now I will invite Kim Benson to take the lectern. Uh, she will give us a short statement about the practical implication of uh, EU's policies and ac of accessing the EU market uh, for this business. And then she will end with a short answer for our speakers. Thank you. Right. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed the conference yesterday, and I'm looking forward to another great day today. Um, I, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to hear Ben Butters uh, give a presentation. I think Ben's in the audience um, today. Uh, ben is the EU Affairs Director for Euro Chambers. And he was referring to an author uh, whose book he had read. And the author had coined the term micro-multinational. And that term was used to describe an emerging class of companies. Companies which are usually small in terms of the number of employees, but which are financially strong, very competitive, and which have a significant international presence. Now, as the co-owner of a small export management company in San Diego, California, I can tell you that we have derived 100% of our revenue over the past 20 years from exports, from international sales. So that term, micro-multinational, really resonated with me. For the first time, I felt understood. <laughs> and I told Ben this. <laughs> um, because so many times when I hear people speak about small businesses, they make generalizations that are simply not true. For example, they will, they will speak as if we were less capable or less sophisticated or even more risk averse than large companies. And in my opinion, nothing could be further than the, than the truth, from, from the truth. In Europe and in the US, small businesses are a primary source of technological innovation, job creation, and even completely new business models. And when I consider global macroeconomic trends, specifically related to small businesses which export, those are the companies that are going to benefit from these, from these trends, regardless of whether they're in Europe or in the US. Let's look at the short term. According to recent estimates, growth in the world trade of goods alone is expected to reach nearly 5% in 2014, which is more than double the 2013 growth figure. And global trade in services, such as you know, the, a wide variety of services, such as architectural services, accounting, legal, et cetera, are continuing to expand rapidly as well. In the longer term, things look even better on the macroeconomic front. The world trade in goods is expected to grow about 8% annually through 2030, which means that trade in goods will double from 2013 to 2020. 22, and it will triple by 2028. That outpaces global GDP growth. Some studies that were done by a major international bank, I think it was HSBC, makes an even further point that exports from advanced economies such as Europe and the US are set to expand very rapidly, particularly in the 2016 to 2020 timeframe. Growth in trade is driven by four main factors. Obviously, global economic growth, but in addition to that, trade liberalization, such as what we are undertaking with the negotiation of TTIP, 
reductions in transport and communications costs, and the continuing build out of global supply chains by such giants as Apple and, and other corporate giants, as you may know, for example, whose activities rapidly increase trade both in the finished products as well as trade in the parts and the components. Trade will be further boosted by new technologies in the realms of e-commerce, high-speed travel, and streamlined customs procedures. And to quote one of my colleagues who is an economist, Kati Suomenen, these trends favor, in particular, small companies seeking growth through internationalization, the ones that are specifically doing the exporting. The costs of international business have never been so low and the opportunity never so large. Our company basically serves as an outsourced export department for companies that don't have one. And basically our task is to identify the right markets for our client companies to enter. And then we go ahead and establish the distribution for the companies in each market and then manage that distribution over time. With respect to our company's experience ex accessing the European market, I can say that yes, for a number of our clients, we've been successful in entering the European market. But I will also say, yes, it has been remarkably challenging, time-consuming, and expensive. One of our major clients is a high-end kitchen appliance manufacturer, so we faced European regulations related to safety and efficiency standards, energy efficiency standards, they were very different from U.S. regulations in terms of their approach. Not in terms of the end goal of having a safe and energy efficient product, mind you, but in terms of the approach to reach the goal. So my question to Ambassador Gardner and Mr. Calleja is this. As representatives of SMEs in Europe and the U.S., what actions can we undertake to support the ongoing efforts of both of our governments to streamline that regulatory process? Can we as SMEs, together with our governments, find a way to turn these challenges into opportunities? Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And now the, the floor to uh, Daniele Baccarino, president of CNA, Italian CNA. Grazie, grazie a tutti voi. Thank you. Thank È un onore per me, an piccolo imprenditore che cerca di essere una micro multinazionale, micro nonché presidente di un'associazione grande, piccole e medie imprese italiane, essere ad un incontro di questo alto livello, di poter portare la voce anche concreta di un imprenditore che cerca di cogliere questa opportunità. Mi permetto di fare piccoli cenni sulla globalizzazione. La crisi finanziaria iniziata nel 2008 ha innescato anche sollecitazioni e politiche protezionistiche spesso sollecitate da operatori colpiti dagli effetti della crisi, ma anche non sufficientemente preparati ad affrontare le spinte della globalizzazione. Di contro però questa situazione spinge molte PMI a misurarsi e a ricercare nuovi mercati pur consapevoli di non disporre di tutte le condizioni necessarie per sostenere le sfide che questo comporta. Anche con il passaggio generazionale che ha ricordato lei il direttore Calica. Importante questa fase. Noi come imprenditori delle PMI italiane siamo quelli più coinvolti nella crisi e quindi abbiamo il dovere e dobbiamo essere particolarmente sensibili a tutte le proposte di nuovi strumenti di politica economica nazionale e soprattutto internazionale come questa del trattato. È un dovere che dobbiamo pur avendo le PMI europee 
e italiane, problematiche del tutto particolari rispetto agli operatori economici degli United States e di altri continenti, riteniamo nuovamente di avere il dovere di gestire processi connessi alla progressiva attuazione del trattato, anche se tale auspicata spinta propulsiva delle economie dei due continenti non annullerà le differenze che ci sono economiche, culturali, tra le diverse aree economiche. Quindi dico le PMI italiane ed europee non devono subire l'internazionalizzazione ma devono essere interpreti. Perché siamo favorevoli? Perché il trattato può offrire delle opportunità. Va ricordato che la sfida aperta dal trattato pone le PMI statunitensi in condizioni non solo per le dimensioni, più favorevoli per l'efficace operatività gestita a livello presidenziale del famoso Small Business Act, ad esempio con una quota di, eh, per gli appalti, in un mercato che favorisce e stimola maggiormente quello europeo la crescita, gli investimenti finanziari e nel capitale umano. Al contrario, nell'Unione Europea, nonostante l'adozione dello Small Business Act appunto nel 2008, prima dell'impatto della crisi, questa politica per le PMI è stata soprattutto di carattere nazionale. Nonostante la frammentazione e i forti divari sociali e economici tra i diversi Stati. Noi diciamo che il, il trattato transatlantico per il commercio e gli strumenti di attuazione per le PMI italiane è importante. L'Italia è il paese con il più grande numero di PMI e ha dato numerosi contributi al, al PIL nazionale. Come veniva ricordato, offerto sul terreno occupazionale un grande ruolo e pertanto per noi operatori delle PMI, forse più ancora di quelli degli altri paesi europei, il trattato rappresenta, deve rappresentare un'opportunità strategica tenuto conto della vastità, tipicità, dinamicità e mutevolezza del mercato nordamericano ma anche della risposta flessibile che, e di adattamento rapido che le PMI hanno alle richieste delle domande. È un fattore molto importante quello della risposta e della dinamicità. Queste prospettive rendono, a parere mio, a parere della mia associazione, necessaria la costituzione di una piattaforma permanente di analisi e confronto, di scambi di buone pratiche per le politiche dei programmi PMI sul piano europeo e statunitense, che deve quindi necessariamente prevedere l'alto coinvolgimento della rappresentanza delle PMI, come veniva già richiesto. Provo a fare alcune proposte. Mentre arrivo alle conclusioni. Sulle politiche commerciali degli United States e dell'Unione Europea bisogna innanzitutto dare maggiore trasparenza e partecipazione del processo negoziale. Bisogna definire una chiusura del trattato per fasi progressive in alcune aree di settori. Abbiamo grandi problemi, problemi di accesso al mercato è già stato ricordato, l'abbattimento delle barriere tariffarie, i dazi, quelle non tariffarie ed apertura agli appalti pubblici. Abbiamo il grosso problema della convergenza degli standard, delle regolamentazioni, delle normative di alcuni settori. Essendo il trattato TTP un accordo aperto che evolverà negli anni, secondo me bisogna continuare a negoziare sulle restanti materie e quindi in particolare sul piano specifico delle PMI.
Sono necessarie politiche di accompagnamento ai negoziati in corso ed è necessario intervenire su temi che ho già sentito precedentemente, che condivido, intervenire sull'informazione, elaborare anche dati e ricerche sull'evoluzione della catena del valore globale del commercio, intervenire sulla comunicazione. Il, Sua Eccellenza l'Ambasciatore ha espresso appunto già i suoi dubbi sui limiti della comunicazione perché bisogna diffondere informazioni qualificate alle rispettive associazioni di imprese e sulle opportunità che derivano dall'entrata in vigore del trattato. Chiedi, credo sia opportuno un partenariato e cooperazione fra le PMI, favorire la messa in comune di reti di imprese e partnership industriale per lo scambio di, di esperienze, per il supporto alle start-up, innovative anche non, partiamo da quelle innovative e la promozione di business incubator. E poi un sostegno a programmi di mobilità, in particolar modo per i giovani perché credo possa essere la forte leva sulla quale concludo io con un paio di domande se mi è consentito a sua eccellenza l'ambasciatore chiedo se per il presente e il futuro del partenariato economico fra l'Unione Europea e gli USA sarebbe favorevole a facilitare la costituzione di una piattaforma permanente di dialogo tra le PMI, PMI europee e statunitensi. Al direttore generale Cagliega chiedo se la, CNA, se la Commissione europea sarebbe favorevole a rendere lo Small Business Act giuridicamente vincolante per le istituzioni comunitarie e per gli Stati membri. Faccio un po' una provocazione. Se fosse possibile proporre l'istituzione di uno Small Business Authority europeo con una funzione di coordinamento e di rafforzamento del ruolo dei Mr. PMI nelle varie, eh, nelle varie nazioni. Vi ringrazio molto per l'opportunità. Grazie. Grazie Presidente Raccarino. So I will give the floor back to the ambassador, and then to Mr. Callega for answering these two questions. So the question was raised, what can SMEs do? Well, first, before I answer that question, let me just mention one other argument that I think is important about what this deal is, what it can do for small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's the question of the cost of inputs. We all know that uh, Europe sometimes pays very high prices for the cost of inputs, not just energy. If this deal is successful in reducing the cost of inputs, small and medium-sized enterprises should become more competitive. And I think that's a very important argument. What can SMEs do? My first answer is raise your voice. Kill the myth that this deal is just about big businesses that are, want to seize most of the cake in uh, the TTIP. Raise your voice and say, this is about you too. This is what you want to see in this deal. Help us define how to do it. And I think the second thing I would say is continue pressure. I use the word pressure on all of us, governments, and also not, not just uh, in the EU or US government, but also at the member state level. Let me be very honest. I read a lot of these reports. I've been reading a lot of these reports about what needs to be done. I think actually we know more or less what needs to be done. The trouble is actually doing it because it's actually very politically difficult to actually do it. Those measures cover tax reforms, labor market reforms, bankruptcy code reforms. On the EU level, it's making sure the single market is perfected, is completed. It also means make it easier for money to flow where it can have an impact, meaning limiting the regulatory burden on venture capital funds, making it easier for pension funds and insurance companies to invest in venture capital. Uh, all of those things and many others we could mention are more or less known. We know what to do them. Now it's the time to actually do it. 
So small and medium-sized enterprises can be helpful in keeping the pressure up. Um, I understand, I hear the issues about transparency. I hear it all the time. We can disagree at a government level. I think all of us do disagree, but it doesn't matter. The perception is there. The perception is there that these negotiations somehow aren't transparent despite the fact that we have stakeholder consultations. We've just had, I don't know, 57 or something like that in uh, this round. We have it every round. We had, uh, you know, this is, this is the most transparent negotiation ever held, but it doesn't matter because this, it's true, this negotiation is fundamentally different from other negotiations we've had. It's not just about tariffs, it's about something else, and people feel they're not getting enough information, so we have to address it. Um, I heard also the mentioning of a closing of partial deal, and that's often mentioned quite often, actually. Uh, the Vice Minister here has mentioned that idea of, of having a partial deal. It's very difficult, though, to have a partial deal because a partial deal, just practically speaking, isn't going to be approved uh, in Congress, and I don't think it would be approved in the European Parliament. You need an ambitious deal because there are a lot of uh, counterbalancing interests involved. We can't just get a deal on tariffs because we want to actually get to the core of what these negotiations are about, which is what we've mentioned, trying to align our regulations, our existing regulations, and to address how we make regulations for the future. And there are a lot of difficult non-tariff barriers, including agriculture, and there's no way we can just close a, 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 a partial deal now. Interesting idea about permanent dialogue between SMEs. Um, I heard you talk about a special chapter, of course, and the more information for SMEs, but why not, is my off-the-cuff answer. Why not? Why can't we think about having a permanent dialogue that brings European small and medium-sized enterprises with U.S. Uh, uh, equivalents to talk about what they would like to see, not only in this deal, but going forward. So I personally would welcome that. Daniel, did I say anything stupid? Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Okay. Then, yeah. Negotiating and on behalf of, I go here. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I will be very brief because I agree with what uh, uh, the ambassador was saying. But I want also to say hello to Signor Razzo, who is the EU negotiator and the SME that I mentioned, and I did not mention her at the beginning. Uh, I was, we were asked, what can um, you do, a small business, in the area? of regulatory cooperation of standards. I think the ambassador gave two very good points. Raise your voice, keep the pressure. I would add a third thing. Help us to focus the negotiations on your key priorities. Tell us what are the real problems that you are facing in transatlantic trade. What barriers are you having? Maybe the tariffs are not very high, but they are still high, so let's do away with the tariffs. But what are the real obstacles that you are facing in your business? You were mentioning some standards. Is it possible to focus on the key areas? It's going to be very difficult to address all of the barriers, all of the issues in one go, but can we work in a direction? But it's very important for us to know what are the key barriers? There are studies going on on both sides of the Atlantic to identify them, but I think be concrete, be focused, tell us which are the issues which are having a greater impact on your business so that at the end of the day, the negotiations come up to something concrete. We are not interested in doing an agreement to have a beautiful agreement negotiated and signed at the highest level. We want an agreement that works, an agreement that brings concrete benefits and that is focused on eliminating the key problems, the key issues that you have. And if you are able to come with joint positions, if the SME organizations on both sides of the Atlantic can share this position, then I think it's even more helpful because the level of pressure for the negotiators increases. If SMEs on both sides of the Atlantic agree on what are the key elements that we have to address and tackle, we have to deliver. There is no excuse. But it's very important that this work is done. 
to the question which I got from our Italian friend. Um, would we be in favor of a small business authority with legally binding powers, an SME, super SME, envoy, authority to force member exactly. states to implement the small business? It's very attractive exactly. for the Commission, this idea. But let me say, I think more important than having a small business authority is to implement all the good ideas that we have. And we have done a lot of progress in Europe. Let me mention the example of the objective of creating a company in three days and for a maximum of 100 euros. This objective is now achieved in 18, practically 20 out of the 28 countries. Of course, I think it's much better when countries do it without having to have punitive powers because we are not doing this to punish anybody. We are doing this because it is in the interest of the, the countries who do it, the countries who, where you can create companies online in some minutes without cost, at the end of the day have more jobs, have more growth, have more entrepreneurs. So personally, I do not believe in a punitive approach or in a authority. But there are examples where, if needed, we can come with specific measures, as we have done with some directives in the area of late payments or with some programs, for example, in the area of access to finance. But my reply would be, let us focus on implementation, let us focus on working together, and only in the areas where it does not work, then we should be ready to come with binding measures. One of the things we are going to discuss with the SME envoys is, for example, for licensing. Do we need to put a target to say, let's see if in Europe, when you want to open a business, you get the license in one month? Is this something that we could agree? And if at the end of the day we are not able to make progress, the Commission has always the possibility to, pro to propose binding measures. And let's look also at what the US is doing, because I think there will be a lot of inspiration measures which have worked on the U.S. side, can't we bring them over and vice versa? And in that way, we facilitate also the transatlantic relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we are now out of time. I have time for just two questions from the audience. I'm sorry, but just two questions. Um, and consider that on details, the TTIP will, discuss, will be discussed in, next, in the next panel next part of the session. So, one here, Mr. Napolitano. Thank you very much. My name is Sergio Napolitano. I'm a Legal Affairs and, and Trade Policy Director at the European Generic Medicines Association, which is an association that represents uh, European generic and biosimilar pharmaceutical producers. Um, we have several SMEs that are also members of our um, association. Um, Many of you actually have mentioned that there are not uh, that many concrete um, examples of uh, um, benefits and advantages for SMEs in, uh, uh, in the context of the TTIP. Actually, we can mention a couple of concrete examples uh, for the pharmaceutical sector, and this is something that we are trying to communicate externally. One is, for instance, the reduction of clinical trials. So um, uh, the avoidance of repeating clinical trials, both in the EU and in the US, exactly the same clinical trials for exactly the same product. This is something that would uh, benefit greatly um, SMEs, especially. Um, another example is the reduction of, uh, of good manufacturing practices inspections from the FDA in the EU and from European authorities in the US. This is also something that would reduce costs for the industry, especially for SMEs, and also for regulatory authorities uh, that would be able to, um, uh, to, to use these resources to inspect other uh, manufacturing plants in countries where the, 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 the level of quality is quite different from the European and the US one. So these are two examples, but the main, um, mine is, is not very much a question, but also a request. Um, we are trying to um, develop a, a communication in order to, to show the importance of this negotiation for 
the industry, for SMEs in particular, but you, we also want to show how important this is for the public. So what the benefits for the public okay. are for the citizens, and this is okay. something that the industry should focus on and also the government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Just one. Is there anyone from the audience here? Very quick, please, because we are in the way of the next panel. That's fine. Uh, I'm from Belgium, uh, federal uh, public uh, government um, administration. So uh, what I often hear is that uh, for European firms, it's especially also important uh, to have a cut down of regulations on the U.S. state levels. So the different U.S. states, they also have all kinds of regulations. How much could that be included in TTIP? Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Gadmi? Couple of answers. Danny, do you want to answer the question about the U.S. states? No. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. That's, That's a very complicated, difficult question, of course, because under our constitutional system, there are a lot of regulations passed at state level, and the federal government can't tell states what to do. Uh, but that's not to say that states have n are not playing a role in these negotiations. They are. We're talking to them, uh, especially about the procurement issues, which are very much uh, front and center of European preoccupations. Um, but we need to convince them that they also have uh, you know, benefits that can be drawn from these negotiations, just as they were signatories to the WTO, for example, government procurement um, uh, agreement. But the, the problem remains what I've mentioned. Um, I'm glad the question was, or the observation was made about, um, about FDA, because it's very real. That is very real. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I had a full session with the person in the U.S. mission to EU who is the FDA representative. She had just come back from a joint audit, a joint inspection together with the European Medicines Agency in Sweden, and they were planning to ha hold further joint audits inspections of uh, other uh, plants, pharmaceutical plants in the EU, and vice versa, that will, it will also happen. The EMA will also have joint inspections in the United States. And the point of all of this is to lead to precisely what you were suggesting, that we don't have multiple tests uh, for the same product. Why? I think it's quite obvious to say. We uh, need to focus our regulatory firepower on where the real risks are. And the real risks are coming from different parts of the world, from the emerging markets. And we need to redeploy resources to where those risks are and perhaps become more efficient in the way we uh, test each other's uh, products. And I think that's, that's doable. Um, and we're seeing real progress in that regard. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We are fine with what with, 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 we said uh, up to now. And Thank you to all the speakers, to Commissioner Nelly Feroci for being here with us. And I